So welcome everyone to our third class, I believe, in uh, this series of five classes on chapter seven of Master Shanti Deva's text. Let's begin as usual with just a few prayers. So I'll share those on the screen so we can recite them together. So we have uh, this first prayer that is the praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, we will recite this three times together. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. And let's do the uh, mandala offering prayer. Uh, again, we'll just do this in English, uh, doing uh, kind of visualizing uh, the entire uh, phenomenal world sort of transformed into a beautiful Buddha paradise, uh, whatever that means to you, and making that vast pure offering to the Buddhas, to the gurus, so we can achieve realizations. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niryata Yami. And then finally, refuge in Bodhicitta before the teaching. Uh, renewing that sense of safe direction that we each individually have, whatever level that is at, uh, in terms of the safe direction we find in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And then the last two lines where we cultivate the motivation of bodhicitta for being here and engaging in the Dharma. And we'll meditate on bodhicitta as well shortly. But let's do this first, once in English, and then twice in the Tibetan. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye chodang soki choknam la, jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi. Daki chunyan gi pe sonam gi dola penchir sangye drupar sho sangye chodang so ki choknam la jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi daki chunyan gi pe sonam gi dola penchir sangye drupar sho all right, let's go ahead and do a short meditation then. Give ourselves a chance to focus the mind a little bit and to uh, kind of uh, generate a good motivation on the basis of that. So, um, one second, I wanna make sure what we're doing here in terms of the view. Uh, okay, all right. So let's go ahead with um, just a few minutes of quiet meditation on the breath. Uh, just do that on your own uh, using whatever technique you prefer. And then in a few minutes, I'll ring, or in a few minutes, I'll come in and lead you in the meditation uh, on bodhicitta. So let me ring the bell to get things started.
So to set our motivation for tonight, I thought it might be useful for each of us to do our own personal examination into this last form of laziness that we're going to be beginning with tonight, what's called the laziness of inadequacy or despondency, where we somehow feel that while the Buddha attained this great result of enlightenment and many, maybe many others have, we ourselves are incapable of doing that. And perhaps each of us has that operating at some level, sometimes dampening our enthusiasm for our practice. Because we put ourselves down, we don't think that we have the ability to accomplish that. So just spend a minute or so just seeing if that's operative in your life in any way, in terms of your spiritual practice. And then to remind ourselves that regardless of these thoughts, regardless of feeling somewhat inadequate, incapable of attaining realizations, what have you, every one of us has Buddha nature. Every one of us has that potential to achieve enlightenment. We have a mind that is fundamentally pure. It will ripen into the mind of a Buddha once we have removed everything that obscures that mind, everything that pollutes that mind. And all we need do is just like the Buddhas of the past, dedicate ourselves to the path of awakening, go about it with great perseverance and enthusiasm and joy. And in this way, we can accomplish the result. So kind of giving yourself a little bit of a pep talk saying, you know, we all can do this. We all can accomplish enlightenment. It's just a matter of putting the causes and conditions into place. And as I mentioned frequently, the main cause, one of the most important causes of attaining this goal is bodhicitta, is setting our sights on attaining enlightenment for the sake of all beings. So bring that mind into your awareness right now, thinking that you're here to engage in this study of Master Shantideva tonight with the intention of achieving full awakening as the means to help all sentient beings to do the same. Okay, good. So we are working our way through chapter seven. I'm hoping we'll cover a fair amount of verses tonight. We've already talked about uh, the obstacles to this enthusiasm. They were introduced at the beginning and then enthusiasm itself was in introduced. And then we went into the first two already, which are the laziness that is um, kind of just clinging to sleep, to not doing anything, to procrastinating, uh, this sort of indolence. And then the second one was the laziness of busyness, where we get quite attached to all the mundane activities that we engage in and, you know, kind of fill our life with all of that. And so we have very little time and energy for our Dharma practice. The third is, as I mentioned in the motivation, this laziness of despondency or um, kind of inadequacy, feeling that we're deficient somehow, we're different than everyone else than all the other great practitioners of the past and somehow we're just not cut out for it we're not able to attain that and this is a as i mentioned in uh, i think the first class this is actually said to be one of the worst forms of laziness because it keeps us from putting any of that energy into our practice when we think we can't possibly attain the goal and of course we're going to hopefully get into tonight the beginning of these four forces or powers that help us to practice enthusiastic uh, perseverance and the very first one is having that aspiration that is 
based on our faith, based on uh, having deep conviction in the Buddha's teachings and the results that we can attain from our practice. So let's go right into the slides and begin our uh, exploration of these verses. Tonight we're going to be going from verse uh, 17 of chapter 7. Uh, verse 16 is in this section on uh, the laziness of despondency, but I'm not going to recover that. Uh, they talked about the sort of four armies that the milit that the king needs and uh, you, you quoted like four different things that are factors. We're going to see a different presentation in the four forces or the four powers. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is an analogy that's, I guess, used a couple of times here in terms of a king needing four armies to overcome the enemy. So again, we're in this, uh, we've identified the obstructing forces and we're looking at the way of abandoning them. Uh, we had the first two that we already covered. Uh, the third one, abandoning the laziness of discouragement, started with verse 16. Once more, this laziness uh, was described by uh, Geshe Loden as delusions of incapacity make up this third type of laziness. It's interesting the way you put that. It's deluded that we're incapable. It is believing that you are not capable of attaining enlightenment, <coughs> excuse me, or engaging in the practices leading to enlightenment. Recall also that I presented to you an alternate way of looking at the verses we're going to go through tonight, um, which is in terms of Master uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's Lama Rim Chenmo. Uh, he, in talking about this third type of laziness, says that we're essentially needing to stop discouragement about two, three things. First, the goal. You know that the goal is is attainable that we have to learn that and not think it's unattainable stopping discouragement about the means to get there to actually accomplish the goal and then stopping discouragement because wherever you are is a place of, to practice kind of getting rid of that discouragement that might think well we have to go through so many existences and so many forms of suffering to get there will we you know is is it really possible for me to be able to do that we get quite discouraged about that prospect so we'll look at all three of these tonight so when we go to the way that Gyaltsup Jay set these out in terms of outlines, this is um, beginning on the top of page nine of Gyaltsup Jay's commentary, how it is taught in the scriptures to practice the antidotes. Again, the first one, first outline heading was verse 16, advice to strive in the antidotes to discouragement. So now we're looking at how it is taught in the scriptures in terms of what the Buddha said about achieving uh, the goal of enlightenment. Again, that's the section that we're in here is talking about the goal of enlightenment and our ability to achieve that. So verse 17 says, I should not be despondent by thinking how can I ever attain enlightenment? Thus, the Tathagatas who speak what is true have uttered this truth. Um, and so actually, yeah, we'll stop there. It goes on to the actual truth that is a sort of paraphrasing of what the Buddha said in that sutra. Let's go ahead and look at what uh, Gyaltsup Jay says. Uh, his commentary is pretty straightforward. He says, do not be despondent saying, the Buddha alone, being a very sharp faculty, achieved his aim by practicing for many countless great eons in the extremely difficult trainings and accumulated infinite merits by making an effort and enthusiasm. Since I am not like this, I'm nothing like the Buddha. Uh, how could I attain enlightenment? Again, we're not like the Buddha yet in terms of all of the fullness of qualities and all the perseverance he had on the path to enlightenment, but we are like the Buddha in terms of having the same potential and just simply needing to put the work into it to achieve that. Uh, it goes on to say, since the Tathagata or Tathagata, different ways of pronouncing that term, it means the one gone thus, it's uh, another name for the Buddha. When the Tathagata speaks the truth, he thus also taught this truth, which is suitable to accept since he has no cause to speak deceptively. So why would the Buddha you know, be deceptive in his speaking? He obviously taught many different things at many different times that some of them might need to be interpreted, but a lot of what the Buddha taught you know, needs to be taken simply at face value. The Buddha said that we all can attain this state. And so the question arises then in Gyaltsup Jay's commentary, in what manner did he teach? You know, what did he say about this subject? that we're looking at. And the answer is to quote from the sutra requested by Subahu. Further, bodhisattvas should practice correctly and with emphasis like this. They should think, if those that turned into lions, tigers, dogs, and jackals, vultures, cranes, crows, and owls, worms, bees, flies, and mosquitoes become awakened in highest enlightenment, then now, while I am a human, 
I need to practice the enthusiasm that achieves enlightenment, even at the cost of my life. Then he goes on to say the same is also said in the cloud, Clouds of Jewels Sutra. So again, this is the idea that beings who have attained these states uh, that are not attained, but who have uh, fallen into these states of being these bugs and animals and whatever, which we of course have done as well. You know, we have the good fortune of being in this human life right now, but we've been in those states and every being who's a Buddha was in those lower rebirths of animals, of hungry ghosts, of hell beings and what have you. So we might look at that and say, well, but you know, those beings don't have the ability to attain enlightenment. Well, not in that state, but after having you know, good karma ripen and attaining a human rebirth, you can then practice the Dharma and you can achieve enlightenment eventually through a series of good rebirths or at least one good rebirth that you use very, very well. So it's not that we should think that um, we don't have that same potential then, because even the beings we look at now in our world that are insects and animals, birds, what have you, we can look at them and say they have the potential to achieve enlightenment as well. So this is again all rooted in the concept of Buddha nature, which as I've explained before is the idea that when it comes down to it, our minds are fundamentally pure. Moreover, at a deeper level, our minds are not inherently existent. You know, when we understand the emptiness of the mind, that the mind doesn't have anything inherently within it, well, then all of the delusions that are within the mind stream uh, can be removed because they're not inherently there. Due to the emptiness of the mind, due to the, the developmental qualities of the mind, that we can actually go through the process of completely purifying our minds, enlightenment is attainable for every being, regardless of the states that they've been in, you know, as bugs or what have you. So let's go on then to the next verse that continues this theme around uh, making sure that we have confidence that we can achieve the goal. This is just again, verses 17 through 19. The next outline then says, one can attain enlightenment if one strives by stopping laziness. So again, in Gyaltsevche's presentation, this covers a whole lot more verses. Uh, nonetheless, can, it can be seen along with verse 19 to still be primarily about achieving the goal of enlightenment. So uh, the first uh, outline within this at the top of page 10 of J says, considering that one can attain enlightenment if one generates the power of enthusiasm. So this is kind of a thought that we should be considering, that we should be re reflecting on is the idea that we too can do this with the right amount of effort. So that quote that we just saw from the sutra um, is repeated here again in, in Shanti Deva's verse. It says, if they develop the strength of exertion, even those who are flies, mosquitoes, bees, and likewise worms will win the unsurpassable enlightenment, which is hard to attain. Since I have been born human by race and recognize what is beneficial and what is harmful, if I do not forsake the deeds of enlightenment, you know, why would I not attain, attain enlightenment? In other words, if we put our energy into it, why wouldn't we attain the goal? If every being has the potential to attain the goal and we here are in a human existence where that is ripe with qualities that has so much going for it. You know, it's like we've, we've landed in the optimal place in terms of the practice of the Dharma. So if we put the effort into it, the energy into it, why wouldn't we achieve the result? I think I even got a teaching from one teacher once where he said, no matter whether you want to attain enlightenment or not, if all the causes and conditions are in place for you to do it, you will attain enlightenment. I mean, it, it's a simple law of cause and effect that is operative all the time, which we're going to see coming up in this uh, you know, uh, next section when we look at how we develop aspiration is to have confidence in the law of cause and effect. And it refers to the obtaining of good results as well as negative results that we have to know that this is what's operating. So if we want to attain enlightenment, all we need to do is put our energy into the causes for that. So again, this is just reiterating a lot of what we already saw with that uh, previous verse in the sutra quote. It says, as it was taught earlier, even those that become flies, mosquitoes, bees, and likewise worms will attain the difficult to attain highest enlightenment if they generate the force of enthusiasm and build up the accumulations. Once more, the accumulations of what Rinpoche calls the two merits, the merit of virtue and the merit of wisdom like the two wings of a bird that are needed to fly to the destination of enlightenment. It goes on to say, since it is taught like this, then someone like oneself, having been born into the special human race, knowing what is beneficial and has to be adopted, adapted, adopted is probably a better word, what harms and what has to be abandoned to attain the aim of the wish for enlightenment, in other words, to attain the goal of Buddhahood, 
if one takes up the practices of enlightenment and does not give them up, if we, you know, persevere and keep moving in that direction, then why should one not attain enlightenment? Determine that you can definitely attain it. So this is the distinction, you know, that again, we have to relish within this is that the, having this human rebirth, one of the most important things we can do then is to gain conviction in the law of cause and effect. Because if we have that conviction, that, that if we adopt virtuous actions, continue to adopt the perfections, um, developing bodhicitta, all the things that are necessary on the path to enlightenment, and we abandon everything that drags us back all of the you know non-virtues and deluded states of mind if we do that the result will ensue there's it's just a simple law of cause and effect uh, but we have to have that confidence in that again we're going to see this when we get to the four powers uh, that help our enthusiasm to develop the first one being an aspiration where it's informed by our own conviction in the law of cause and effect so let me go ahead and continue on, carry on into the next outline heading. Now we are moving into that second topic according to Tsongkhapa, which is uh, stopping discouragement about uh, the means to attain the goal. Like we might think, well, okay, the goal's attainable, but you know, you're asking me to do an awful lot here. <laughs> the things you're asking me to do, I'm not so sure I can can reach that level. And it's particularly has to do with this one that's always set out, which has to do with giving one's own body to others. So the um, this is, outline is called the austerities that accomplish enlightenment are suitable to bear since they do not possess even partially the sufferings of the lower realms. This is going to be further divided into three different outlines. The first one is the fear of the austerities of giving up legs, arms, and so forth is unsuitable. So once more, we might have a fear that this austerity that some bodhisattvas are called upon to do, and we all should eventually have the willingness to do of giving our body, giving our arms, legs, what have you, to other beings. Uh, it's easy to have a fear of that right now because we're quite attached to our bodies and we don't really see you know, that in the right light. But uh, over time, we can actually learn to be okay with that. So the opinion is set forth in verse 20. First, it says, having to give away my legs, arms, and so forth frightens me. And again, we can all freely admit that that is something that we're not that warming up to yet, and that's okay. We're not quite there yet. The response that's given by in Master Shanti Deva's verse is that without analyzing what is heavy and what is light, I am reduced to fear through confusion. In other words, not having kind of a relative understanding of what suffering is involved. You know, that we think that doing this sort of thing would actually be great suffering, but actually to engage in non-virtue or to, you know, turn away from the bodhisattva path would bring about even greater suffering. So we're not really analyzing what is heavy and what is light correctly. So we're reduced to fear through our own internal confusion. Uh, this section also includes verse 21 where that point is being made that we've suffered an awful lot without any real value to it. Over countless billions of eons, I have, uh, maybe I have been is probably a better way to put it, or I guess will be is fine too. I have been and will be cut, stabbed, burned, and chopped up many times, but I will not attain enlightenment. You know, it, it hasn't gotten us to enlightenment so far, all of the times that we've endured unbelievable suffering in the lower realms, in the hell realms. And we will continue to do that if we don't put the effort and energy into enlightenment and it won't get us anything. All it's gonna do is consume the negative karma we created, but we will never be free from that cycle of continuing to create negative karma until we you know, address the fundamental problems. So there is a, um, in the commentary, this is on page 11 of Gelsub J, the objection is raised just like we saw in verse 20, or the opinion. Well, though one can achieve it through enthusiasm, I am afraid because one needs to practice the generosity of giving away one's legs, arms, head, and so forth. And I am not able to engage in these difficult practices. You know, we might get very um, inspired in some way when we read these accounts, like the one that's in the Golden Light Sutra of the Buddha giving his, well, he was a prince at that time, a bodhisattva, who happily gave his body to the tigress so she could uh, feed her cubs and restore her own strength and what have you. Um, but, you know, when you really think about it, if you were like out for a walk in the mountains, you went somewhere where there are mountain lions around and say you came across the same situation, that there's a mountain lion there with uh, three or four cubs or five cubs, whatever, and you 
know that you could save that lion, you know, by feeding her because she's emaciated, not incapable of sustaining her own life, much less the life of her offspring. How many of us would actually even think about that? You know, we might run down to the you know, Whole Foods or something and buy a bunch of meat and bring it up there. <laughs> that might be, you know, perfectly fine solution for where we're at. But, you know, in these stories of the Buddha when he was a bodhisattva, he was joyous in doing this. He realized at that point that this was no more than giving away, as we're going to see in a verse coming, vegetables. Like if you gave vegetables to that person, it'd be the same as giving them your body, giving them your arm, your leg, what have you. So the answer is set out, though one needs to practice generosity with these without having distinguished well between heavy and light suffering. One is ignorant with regards to what it has to be abandoned and what has to be adopted. And one is afraid, although it is really unnecessary to be afraid. Because what happens is as one continues to practice, the amount of suffering involved in that sort of act is actually <laughs> minimal or not even there. You know, as I said, when he was this Bodhisattva prince, the, the, he, the Buddha actually gave his body joyfully to the tigress, had no qualms about it. It wasn't like after he'd, you know, because he had to actually sever his own neck so the tiger could begin to, you know, partake of the blood so it could be strong enough to then eat the, his flesh. Had no regrets. Didn't like, oh, uh oh, what have I done? You know, <laughs> which is what most of us might do at this juncture, right? You know, so he goes on to say, you know, while circling in cyclic existence since beginningless time, one has experienced the sufferings of one's body being cut, stabbed, burned by fire, slashed by weapons, not only once, but many times for innumerable tens of millions of eons in the hells. They say the duration of lives in the hells is unfathomable. It just goes on forever. This is why, again, I, uh, when we talk about hell and heaven in a Christian tradition, um, it's understandable that you might have some putting forward that experience as being eternal because it feels like an eternity when you're in those types of realms. Even in the God realms where you have these great pleasures, it feels like you're there all the time then and then eventually the karma wears out and you fall from that. Well, eventually in the hell realms, the karma wears out as well and you go to another existence on the basis of whatever karma ripens then. But in the meantime, you're being tortured unbelievably. You're experiencing un untold suffering. And he says there, but however much one has experienced this, it has only exhausted purposely the power of one's body and one has not achieved highest enlightenment. And we haven't achieved anything meaningful out of all of that suffering. So we're not getting uh, this whole point of like not seeing heavy and light. Actually, the heavy suffering occurs when we end up in these realms and have to endure unbelievable suffering for eons. The light suffering is the suffering that comes in just that moment when one gives one's life, you know, to a being who needs it at that time. Again, we don't do that before we're ready to do that. That's one of the key things that's set out in all these teachings is that you have to be prepared to do that. You have to be ready to do that. But that's the whole point. As you progress on the path with greater and greater enthusiasm, you will get to a point where it'll be like giving away nothing. So that's kind of where we're heading to in terms of this um, this argument that's being put forward to keep us from having any discouragement about what we have to accomplish in order to attain enlightenment. So the next outline on page 11 in the middle says, one does not need to experience the sufferings of the lower migrations even partially. You know, so this is this idea that we're also, you know, maybe not seeing quite correctly what all happens as we are proceeding on the path to enlightenment. Uh, verse 22 says, yet this suffering for my accomplishing enlightenment will have a limit. It is like the suffering of having an incision made in order to eliminate the harm of pain, destroying it inside. So rather than kind of getting hung up on how much I might have to do all of that, the reality is, is that once we go through that suffering, it's final. <laughs> you, you go through it and then you attain enlightenment and you no longer suffer any longer. It's like the suffering of a doctor making an incision in order to, you know, get at an infection that is, needs to be removed in order for the pain to stop and in order for the illness to stop. So again, we're not seeing things quite correctly in terms of even what's entailed in accomplishing enlightenment that while you, once more in these hell realms, you can go through <laughs> suffering again and again and again, and, and it's seemingly endless. You know, whereas if you actually engage in the, the, a bit of suffering that's entailed to attain enlightenment, it comes to an end. 
much better to put our energy into something that actually resolves it once and for all. Because upon our attaining enlightenment, of course, even prior to enlightenment on the Bodhisattva path, they say that Bodhisattva has removed all the causes of their own suffering. We're going to see this coming up too, that uh, Bodhisattvas don't really experience suffering because of their realization of emptiness when they have attained that, nor even from the, the fact that they don't create the negativities that will result in suffering to their body and what have you. So here Gelsup J says, if one considers the sufferings of the lower migrations, then the sufferings of the austerities of attaining enlightenment are of small measure, and they last only a short time by comparison. They are also easy to bear, similar to being able to bear the sufferings of a bodily procedure, and, you know, surgeon, surgical procedure, what have you, to clear the harm of paralyzing pain. And if we look at it from that vantage point that on the other side of this, you, you have peace and calm and no more suffering. So why not put our effort into again doing that, enduring some suffering for the sake of a greater goal, rather than keep doing what we're doing, which only gets us into deeper and deeper suffering that has no real end because we haven't created the causes for it. So now we go on to the third outline within this section, which is still on this topic of discouragement with regard to the means to attain the goal. The example of how it is suitable to bear small sufferings, to destroy a big sickness. So here in verse 23, Shanti Deva says, even all doctors eliminate illness with unpleasant medical treatments. So in order to overcome manifold sufferings, I should put up with a little discomfort. You know, we should be quite happy again to endure a little bit of difficulty in order to attain the happiness of enlightenment. You know, that is a state that we will never degenerate from. So again, this is an important uh, thing to distinguish. Um, I th wanted to reshare this slide that I shared in uh, the last course on uh, uh, patience because it's equally applicable here. Uh, this is from a teaching Rinpoche gave uh, in Italy that I had the good fortune to attend. It was a part of a month long retreat. I can't say I went to every session in the retreat because I didn't, <laughs> but at the one session I was at, he said this and I went back and even checked the wording of it. And this is how he put it, seeking pleasure, which results in only suffering that you should not do because essentially that's what we've been doing. We keep chasing after the pleasures of existence and don't really put our energy into the Dharma. And, you know, again, this isn't quite the topic we're looking at here because we're looking at discouragement, but nonetheless, this is what we have to avoid is the happiness, the pleasure that, only results in suffering. Whereas the second one, which is what is being talked here about here, seeking suffering, which results in only happiness, that you should do. Seeking that bit of difficulty, austerities, or whatever you have to engage in to help to get to the goal of perfect happiness, which is much different than the transitory pleasures we have in this life, uh, that we should do, that we should engage in. You know, and we can accomplish that is the whole point that is being made in this section of Shanti Deva's text, because otherwise we get discouraged thinking, how could I muster up the energy to endure all of that difficulty? Well, it's not that difficult, <laughs> first point. Secondly, it's going to, you know, be uh, much better than enduring the suffering of the lower realms, which we, you know, know is much greater. And it's going to only last a short time and get us to a result where we don't have to experience it again. So we should have great confidence that this is what we actually need to do to engage in that bit of suffering that will lead to perfect happiness. So at the top of page 12, all physicians will employ slightly disagreeable cures to make an unpleasant sickness go away. Likewise, since the austerities to achieve enlightenment are very small sufferings, one should bear the small suffering of the austerity to destroy the many sufferings of psychic existence. In this way, one pacifies boundless sufferings of self and other, and of course achieves happiness for both oneself and becomes dedicated to achieving happiness for others. So it is true that a lot of physicians, you know, will engage in some painful practice to help to alleviate things, you know, in our day and age, maybe it's not as common, but I, I you know, still there's can be a lot of discomfort. The one thing I might point out here, and it is going to come up in the next verse, is that the Buddha never taught a path of absolute austerities because he demonstrated in his life as Siddhartha when he be, you know, showed the aspect of becoming enlightened that neither the path of self-indulgence, which is what he was doing at the palace, you know, living a, the high life with all of his indulgences and things, nor the path of self-mortification or austerities lead to enlightenment. 
you know, because he practiced those with when he left the palace and went to you know work with these great meditators and practitioners, and practice you know fasting the body and torturing the body in a sense to try to free his awareness, his consciousness, attain enlightenment. That didn't work, you know. So we're not talking about a path that is all austerities anyway. It's a middle way always between these. There will be times in our path where we do have to engage in some bit of suffering, difficulty, um, but that is not the totality of our path. You know, our path is actually very much in that middle territory where we engage in some things that kind of get us out of into that realm uh, that are a bit more austere. But we also recognize that we're living beings who need to sustain our bodies, need to be dedicated to helping others and so on. So it's always finding a middle way. So this is what we're going to see actually in the next verse in verse 24. Let's go into this section, which has a number of um, uh, outlines within it. Uh, and uh, page 12, it says they are suitable to bear, these sufferings are suitable to bear, since the king of physicians actually heals diseases with gentle methods. You know, that actually the Buddha, as I was just pointing out, is a pretty, you know, nice middle way kind of guy. You know, he doesn't really ask us or you know, demand that we practice great austerities to attain enlightenment anyway. So there are three sections to this. The first one, the Buddha shows methods to cure great diseases without having to experience the slightest suffering. This is that idea once more of the middle way. But the supreme physician does not employ such ordinary remedies. With a very gentle procedure, he remedies the boundless great ailments. So again, this is just uh, holding out that idea that we don't have to go through unbelievable austerities. The Buddha himself taught a path that is this middle way that isn't too tight or too loose. It's finding a, a right balance between those. Here, the commentary by Gelsup J says, while one is working to achieve enlightenment, the supreme of physicians, the able one, the Muni, the Buddha, does not employ austerities like the common cures to cure sicknesses. He heals the boundless heavy sickness of having to wander in psychic existence due to the afflictions with the method of a happy path leading to a happy result without the extremes of being tired and exhausted or sensual decadence. You know, these two extremes, central decadence is that what I was referring to as that self-indulgence, nor the extreme of being tired and exhausted and, you know, overburdened by the path and what have you through practicing all that self-mortification and austerities. Therefore, how is it suitable to be afraid of the austerities? You know, the Buddha is not asking you to do all these things, you know, right from the get-go, certainly, you know, the idea that we were looking at of giving one's body, well, you, you train gradually to the point where you would be joyful in giving your body. We would be no different than giving away vegetables and what have you. But until you're there, you don't practice that level of austerity or self-mortification. It's just not appropriate. And again, many of us may never be called upon to do that for another being, but we should have that joyous enthusiasm that would gladly do that uh, if we were called upon. Uh, the second outline in this section is it is forbidden to give one's body for as long as one has difficulty, as I've been pointing out. So I don't need to really say too much about this verse. At the beginning, the guide, the Buddha, applies the giving of such things as vegetables. Later, having become accustomed to that, one may progressively give away even one's flesh. You know, so we don't start off with the hardest form of giving and then, you know, get defeated by that. So again, that's, we shouldn't be discouraged about that. Right from the get-go, you're not asked to do that level of generosity. Your generosity should begin with something as simple as taking something like this little rock I have and like giving this rock, you know, to your other hand and you go, oh, thank you. And then this rock gives it to the other hand and says, oh, thank you. I mean, teachers, I guess it was one of the Kadampa masters that said this is a means to begin to get our mind into that place of giving. Hopefully most of us are advanced beyond that. We don't need to sit around passing a rock from hand to hand. But, you know, give what feels comfortable to give, but keep pushing the envelope, you know, keep moving in a direction so that you begin to expand the horizon of what you can comfortably give to others. And when you have, as we're going to see, this wisdom of emptiness that uh, comes into play, then you have no I that is driving the whole attachment to this body or to the things that we possess, and you give freely. 
And that, of course, happens when one attains the first ground uh, of the uh, path of, on the path of seeing, when one has one's in, uh, initial sort of direct insight into emptiness. So let's go and finish off this section with the third part of it. Um, that again is still all dealing with this idea of how the Buddha, you know, helps us uh, to get to this place of giving at this level. This outline is at the top of page 13. It is not difficult since the time taught for giving one's body is when one is habituated to give it like a vegetable. So we start off giving vegetables and things that don't have much uh, you know, impact on us. And eventually our body is like giving a vegetable. At such a time when I have generated a mind that regards my body as being like vegetables, then what hardship will there be when it comes to giving away my flesh? You know, if I get to that point where it's as insignificant as giving away you know, a carrot or something, <laughs> when giving my body doesn't have any great, greater impact upon me than that. The way that giving away a carrot now, you know, might not even mean that much. But nonetheless, you know, this is indicating that when you get to that place, that's when you have permission to give your body. That's when you would actually be comfortable giving your body. Before that, it's actually breaking your bodhisattva vows, uh, the secondary vows that pertain to generosity, to give before one is ready to give uh, in terms of one's own training and practice is a fault, is a downfall. So we need to be attentive to this and not extend ourselves beyond what we are comfortable with, but don't become complacent either. I guess that's the, the caveat with all of this is don't think, well, then I just keep doing what I'm doing and never really look at you know, becoming more capable of giving uh, all the way up to giving my body. Gelsip J says, once one has through familiarity generated the awareness of the generosity of one's body as the generosity of a vegetable or the like, then one can offer one's flesh and such. Until that time, it's you know forbidden. It's not something that you should do. Where lies the difficulty in that? Since there is not the slightest difficulty, it is unsuitable to be afraid. At that point, difficulty doesn't enter into the picture. Just like when, you know, now if we were to give a carrot or a potato or whatever to somebody, say we just went to the store and somebody needed that and we gladly give it to them, you know, or a loaf of bread or whatever it is that we have, we might be able to give those things away quite easily right now. Well, it's not going to be difficult to give your body then either because you will have trained your mind to get to that place. So this was this whole section up through verse 26, 20 through 26, that uh, Lama Tsongkhapa says has to do with making sure that we don't have any discouragement about how we attain that goal, the means to attain that goal through practicing specifically here this level of generosity. But obviously that's not the only practice that we might have some qualms about. You know, even just to sit in meditation, a lot of people think, well, you know, I, how am I ever going to attain the state of calm abiding where I can have that uh, basis for developing realizations and what have you? Well, you can attain it. It does involve, you know, having a very dedicated practice and what have you. But, you know, it's attainable. Everything is attainable over time. We just keep putting our energy into it, our enthusiasm into it, and don't get discouraged thinking that you can't do it or that the means are too difficult. So now we get into this third part that it is suitable to like the austerities since they lack suffering and are strengthened by happiness. Again, this is the start of the third point that Lama Tsongkhapa talked about, which was called stopping discouragement because wherever you are is a place of practice. The idea being that we might have this mind that gets very discouraged thinking, oh, I have to go through unbelievable number of existences and psychic existence, enduring all kinds of suffering in order to get there. But you know, the, the point that's being made here is, is that you may have to do some of that, but you're going to be creating the causes wherever you are by practicing at that time to attain enlightenment. It, it's not like it goes on forever, you know, that we are going to be stuck in some pattern of suffering. Um, if we use every one of our lives quite skillfully and practice wherever we are in whatever existence we have, well, then we will have, uh, we'll see the end of all of this, the light at the end of the tunnel. So there are four sections to this. Verse 27 is the first one, though it's got a long title. I can see on page 13. Though a person who is unskilled in the sequence of training in the path has physical and mental unhappiness, those who are skilled do not have the suffering of austerities. This is what I was pointing out earlier is that, you know, as you progress on the path, you don't even experience 
those sufferings. You stop creating the causes uh, for physical suffering because you've stopped creating bad karma that would result in that. Moreover, you stop creating the causes for mental suffering because you realize the nature of reality through your own wisdom realizing emptiness. Or if you haven't realized emptiness, you are generating more compassion on the basis of having to endure suffering. So let's look at verse 27 that starts this section. It says, due to having abandoned negativities, there is no suffering. As I just said, you know, if you've abandoned all the negative karma, well then no physical suffering will ensue. And due to skill, there is no unhappiness. Due to the skill that has in, within one's mind an understanding of what is uh, the true nature of things, not clinging to the self and so on. So thus, mind and body are, are, are harmed by wrong conceptions and negativities. So there's no mental unhappiness if we have the wisdom realizing emptiness, and there's no physical suffering if we abandon negativities. But if we don't do those, then mind and body are continuing to be harmed. So let's, I'm going to use Abbot Dr. Geltzen's commentary on this. I just like the wording of it a little bit better and the way it's set out. So uh, I won't read Geltzen J's, um, and again, this will be in the slides that you receive uh, that'll be posted on the um, uh, website tomorrow. A bodhisattva does not suffer physically in giving his body out of a pure attitude of compassion because due to having abandoned all negativities of the three doors, body, speech, and mind, uh, they are skillful when giving their body, whereupon there is not even mental unhappiness. You know? So the, the combination of these, they're not experiencing any physical pain because they haven't created the causes for that through their own negative karma, nor are they experiencing mental pain because they're doing it skillfully with a mind that is imbued with compassion and wisdom. For this reason, wrong conceptions adhering to I and mind of the person, as well as negativity such as killing, do harm the mind and body. But the great heroic ones have or heroic minded ones have reversed the causes of harm. So this is getting at this idea that again, you know, why we experience uh, certain physical things in our life and so on uh, experiences is because of our karmic actions, the things that we've done in the past that result in that. If the bodhisattva is not engaging in that behavior because they have, you know, purified their morality, their behavior, uh, then obviously they're not creating the causes to have that type of harm. So things can look like that, like, you know, I guess the example of the Buddha when he was the prince giving his body to the tigress, if somebody was there witnessing that, they could say, well, that must be really painful to like, you know, sever your own flesh and then watch it being eaten by a tigress, you know, so consumed over time. But, you know, for the, for the, the, the Bodhisattva prince, there was no suffering, physical suffering, because he hadn't created the causes for that karmically. I'm, again, just imputing on that situation uh, if it's in the vein of what we're talking about here. And then there's no mental suffering because there's no longer any clinging to this strong sense of an eye that is attached to this body, that is, you know, looking at this as a inherently existent self. So again, we're going to get into more of the wisdom of emptiness when we get to chapter nine, but this is already bringing that awareness into play in terms of recognizing that we're really not talking about a suffering that is going on mentally or physically for this being who is at this level of development. Now, what I've um, done to kind of increase our understanding of this is I've gone to Lama Tsongkhapa's Illumination of the Thought, which is actually his commentary on Chandrakirti's text, where a similar verse is uh, cited. And um, the question is raised in that commentary by Tsongkhapa, is physical suffering experienced by bodhisattvas who give away external and internal phenomena and who are said to generate wonderful happiness for many giving? And this is similar to, I think, the question Fernando asked a few weeks ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago. He says, um, if this question is asked in terms of great beings who have attained a ground, meaning those who have had a direct realization of emptiness, no physical suffering occurs, as is the case when mindless things are cut. You know, if you would cut, to, cut a green bean or a carrot or something, it doesn't, doesn't um, you know, have any suffering occurring. The questions of Gagana Ganja Sutra says, it is this way. There is, for instance, a grove of great shala trees, and when someone enters it and cuts down a tree, the remaining trees do not become desirous or angry, thinking it was cut down, not us. They have no thought or imagination. Such patience in a bodhisattva is the supreme, thoroughly purified patience, equal to space. 
Also, Nagarjuna's precious garland says, if his body does not suffer, how can he suffer in mind? Through great compassion, he feels pain for the world and so stays in it long. So Nagarjuna is saying this about those who have attained a ground. So if you've attained the first ground, which begins again on the path of seeing, for those who are definite in the Mahayana, you have some, some beings who enter the Hinayana and develop their mind all the way through that and attain the state of foe destroyer. They have to come into the Mahayana after having realized emptiness on their own path. So that would be a little different for them because their, their path would look a little different. But if you're entering the Mahayana from the get-go, generating bodhicitta and practicing the five paths, the first path being the path of uh, accumulation, uh, or what Rinpoche calls the path of merit, uh, the path of preparation. All of these are prior to your direct realization of emptiness, your initial one. When you get to the path of seeing, the third path is when you have that insight into emptiness in this non-conceptual way. And you're fundamentally changed after that because what you had been believing in, in terms of this concrete sense of I that's inherently here, is no longer it no longer has any juice behind it. You haven't removed that ignorance completely, but you never have any conviction in it any longer because you've seen truth, you've seen reality. So any clinging to this body or mind as being an inherently existent I doesn't arise because there's no fuel for it, nothing that would validate it. Whereas we are still under the control of our ignorance and haven't yet developed the antidote that will counteract that. So for a bodhisattva who's achieved at least the first ground, and of course above through the entire 10 grounds or 10 bhumis, um, they will not have this suffering present because there's no longer any clinging to the body as being me as being I. So even on the first ground where it said that you attain this surpassing practice of the perfection of generosity, you can freely give away your body with no qualms because there's no attachment to it as being an I. Yeah. So again, we can't even imagine what this is like, but this is at least, you know, spelling it out for us and showing that this is um, uh, what happens to those bodhisattvas. But then Tsongkhapa goes on to say, if the question is asked in terms of those who have not attained the very joyful ground, which is the first ground, in which there is no attachment to body and resources, then physical suffering definitely does arise since conditions contrary to sustaining the body befall it. However, suffering at that time only causes one to become more involved in the welfare of sentient beings. In other words, compassion takes over. And when we experience physical suffering due to giving our body or whatever the case might be, we don't, it doesn't even register as that. It registers as a compassionate thought in response to that. We identify with the suffering of others rather than getting caught up in our own suffering. And this is where Chandrakirti's actual root text is quoted. It says, through his own suffering and cutting and giving away his body, he sees with knowledge others' pain in hells and so forth and strives quickly to eliminate their suffering. So once more, for the bodhisattva who's not even attained the first ground, they don't even have their direct realization of emptiness, they're still going to have a completely different experience of that. It just increases their compassion and their wish to become a Buddha for the sake of others. It feeds into their joyous enthusiasm for giving for all the other practices of a bodhisattva. Um, Whoops, yeah, there's a little more commentary here. A bodhisattva understands the frightful state of migrators, such as hell beings, animals, and hungry ghosts. He sees that physically they are overwhelmed with great suffering, which is without a break and thousands of times more unbearable than that of mutilating his own body. Through his own suffering, not considering what he suffered when he cut his body and gave it to a beggar, but because of that painful experience, he very quickly begins striving to eliminate the sufferings of other sentient beings in the hells and so forth. So as I just said, it, it just feeds the enthusiasm and the effort uh, of the bodhisattva. So again, I'm going to do the same thing with verse 28. We're not going to read the um, Gyaltsup Jay's commentary. Uh, instead, I'm going to read uh, the commentary from the Abbot Dukpa Gyaltsen. Uh, this outline, I'm sorry, was uh, there is no cause then for a great bodhisattva to be tired of cyclic existence. If their bodies are happy due to their merits, in other words, having accumulated only virtue, there's no reason for physical uh, pain, difficulty, and their minds are happy due to their skill, then even if they remain in psychic existence for the sake of others, why would the compassionate ones be disheartened? 
you know. Because <laughs> again, their whole relationship to suffering is totally changed. What might look like suffering or appear like suffering or certainly be experienced as suffering by all of us who haven't attained these states isn't seen that way at all. Instead, it increases their compassion. It is something they don't experience because they're not clinging to the self and what have you, just like we just discussed. So here, Abbot Dr. Gelson says, if due to their merits of generosity and so forth, the bodies of the heroic minded are happy as a result of their, you know, giving this, giving their body and due to their skill in what is to be adopted and what is to be discarded as well as in the meaning of emptiness, their minds are happy just like the bodhisattva, sada prabhudita, then even if they remain in psychic existence for the sake of others, why would the compassionate ones be disheartened? Why would you lose, you know, heart and all of this and, and not continue or generate even greater enthusiasm? There's no reason for them to be disheartened. There's a quote here from Lama Tsongkhapa's Lamrim Chenmo, where he says, since the bodhisattvas have abandoned negativities, they have reversed the causes, whereby resultant suffering feelings do not arise. Due to the stable realization of cyclic existence's lacking inherent nature, having you know, emptiness and being like an illusion, they have no suffering in their mind whatsoever. If their physical and mental happiness grows, then there is nothing to be disheartened about, even if they dwell in psychic existence. Thus, think like this. So this is kind of getting at this point that, you know, although we say that bodhisattvas have to, you know, continue to abide in psychic existence in samsara to accumulate the merit and develop their minds to enlightenment, it's not like you're being sentenced to unbelievable suffering because your relationship with suffering changes. Because every place you go to becomes a, a place for deepening your practice if you once more keep putting the energy into it developing greater and greater compassion, greater and greater wisdom until you achieve the wisdom realizing emptiness. So it's not once more, you know, a huge pain or difficulty for beings at that level to do this. But once more, that's emphasizing why we shouldn't get discouraged when we think about these uh, types of behaviors. The goal is attainable, the means to attain it, you know, we can build our fortitude up to that so that we don't have to do those immediately. And third, our relationship with suffering is going to change over time anyway, because as you develop your mind and continue to be in samsara, wherever you're at as a place of practice, you're not going to have the same experience that you would if you were being under the control of your self-cherishing and self-centeredness and what have you. All of those things, uh, your self-grasping um, that keep us bound in samsara. So that almost brings to conclusion. We got uh, two more sections, but we're getting to the end of this. And this outline is called, for these reasons, they are said to be more skilled in achieving the path than a Hinayana or Hinayanist, I guess would be a better way to put it. Usually they don't use Hinayana to refer to the person. That's the path that they are on. It's, so let's go to verse 29. It says, due to the strength of the mind of enlightenment, uh, the Bodhisattva exhausts their previous negativities and gathers oceans of merit. Hence, they are said to excel the hearers. The hearers, once more, are one of the two practitioners that practice the Hinayana path. There are the hearers and the solitary realizers. Um, hearers are those who, you know, hear the Mahayana Dharma but don't necessarily practice, but they also, you know, hear it uh, and take it to heart and attain their own nirvana, their peace. Um, whereas um, the solitary realizers, they definitely achieve their enlightenment through the force of teachers, but in their very last life, they make prayers to be born where there are no teachers. So they can realize enlightenment, attain the state of uh, arhat, foe destroyer, uh, on their Hinayana path um, without having to rely upon teachers in that final existence. Um, so again, due to the strength of enlightenment, we're kind of exhausting our negativities, keeping them from uh, producing any kinds of results, and we're attaining unbelievable merit. Remember that having the Bodhisattva vows, holding the Bodhisattva vows, gives you unbelievable merit. And we saw this back in uh, chapter one, actually I could have left it on that screen because I put those verses in here. But remember back in the first course I did about a year ago, <laughs> seems like longer time than that because of everything that's been going on. But we went through verses 17 through 19 of chapter one, where it says, although great fruits will arise in psychic existence from simply the aspiring mind of bodhicitta, the mind that wishes for enlightenment, 
an uninterrupted flow of merit will not arise as in the case of the engaging mind. Engaging bodhicitta is when you unite that aspirational thought with the bodhisattva vows and the deeds of the bodhisattva. For one who has perfectly adopted this mind with the thought never to turn away for the sake of totally liberating the infinite realms of sentient beings, from that time onwards, even while asleep or lacking conscientiousness, a force of merit equal to the sky will continuously ensue. So this is what the advantage of having the bodhisattva vows is, is that when you have them and you continue and keep them purely, they generate unbelievable merit. It's like the clock is spinning, <laughs> developing more and more merit all the time. It's not like most of us because we, we have uh, maybe, well, prior to attaining the, you know, some level of uh, adopting the bodhisattva vows, you would only be getting merit when you engage in some sort of virtuous action that is uh, intended to do that. But here, even when you're asleep, because you took those vows with such a strong virtuous intention, uh, wanting to benefit all sentient beings, you'll continue to accumulate merit, even in those times when you're not quite aware of what's going on. So in um, page 14, the commentary on this, Gyaltsev J says, since those with compassion exhaust previous negativities with the power of the mind of enlightenment, again, specifically the engaging mind, though even the aspirational mind has unbelievable benefits in terms of our merit. And because they contain an ocean of accumulations of merits and wisdom, they are said to be superior in progressing along the path than the hearers. So those who are on that Hinayana path, the bodhisattvas, you know, excel them in unbelievable ways. There's even a whole section in uh, the illumination of the thought that I quoted from earlier, where Tsongkhapa talks about how superior the bodhisattvas are, even on these initial levels of the path compared to arhats and what have you, because the mind of bodhicitta makes one much more powerful in terms of one's practice, because it's not about me attaining enlightenment for myself or in liberation for myself. It's about attaining enlightenment for all sentient beings. So we have one more section and then we will have finished up this whole discussion of the three types of laziness, as well as certainly this third one. Hence, it is unsuitable to be discouraged from the actions of a bodhisattva. This is a famous verse, I may have heard it before. So, having mounted the horse of the mind of enlightenment that dispels all disheartenment and weariness and proceeds from happiness to happiness, from joy to joy, which ones who know of this mind would lapse into despondency? So it's kind of telling us, you know, we've got this wrong idea if we think that somehow this is not a path that we want to follow because it's kind of too hard or too difficult, too much suffering, whatever. You know, actually, it's a path that is only about happiness. We're going from happiness to happiness, from joy to joy. Maybe there's times right now where it doesn't feel like that, where it feels like it's an awful lot of work and very hard. But, you know, the promise is that certainly over time and as we begin to attain greater realizations and actually have bodhicitta in our minds and continue on the path of accumulation, preparation, and so on, all of this becomes, you know, just more and more joyful. We should already know some joy from our own practice. I mean, I certainly, when I compare my mind to where it was at uh, before I even started practicing the Dharma, studying the Dharma back in 1992 and earlier, you know, I know that I'm a much more joyful person now than I was then. And that we should see it at some level in terms of our practice. Or there was that one quote that I think I've shared before. One of my teachers said, if you're practicing Buddhism and it's not fun, it's not joyful, well, then you're doing it the wrong way. So we just have to kind of remember that that's also part of our practice. And it's going to be one of the four powers that we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to begin our survey of those shortly. Top of page 15, the commentary on verse 30 that we just went through, uh, just talked about a little bit. Therefore, having mounted the powerful horse of the mind of enlightenment that dispels all mental tiredness and physical weariness, who of those proficient that know the mind that goes from the path of mental and physical happiness to the result of happiness will be discouraged? You know, knowing that you're going to get this sort of quick path to attaining that, because horses are pointed out here, because at that time, of course, to have a, a horse to be able to travel from one place to another would take you a lot less time than walking there yourself. You know, nowadays it might be like to, to have the Maserati or something, you know, to have some some really fast car that could get you or even some one of these, you know, 
space uh, ships or whatever that they're sending up into space that have unbelievable um, velocity to them. You know, knowing that you're going to be on this thing that's going to go really quick, it's going to take you, you know, to this state, to perfect happiness, from one happiness to the next happiness. Knowing that this is what we have as our path, why would we be despondent? Why would we feel like this is something to be discouraged about? It is unsuitable to be discouraged from practicing the bodhisattva actions. Okay, so that is this whole first section that has to do with the uh, obstacles, the obstructions to our having enthusiasm, which are essentially, again, those three types of laziness. Let's move on and try to get a little bit of this section done before I open it up to questions. Um, this next section is beginning on page 15. It says, increasing the antidote, the power of enthusiasm. And this is the remainder of the chapter, all the way you know, through verse 76, uh, the conclusion of this chapter. This is divided in turn into three parts. The very first part starts on 15 as well, increasing the powers that are the conducive conditions for enthusiasm. So these powers are going to cover some 38 verses or something that, that kind of give us um, uh, the tools that we need to have to utilize to increase our enthusiasm. So this in turn is divided into a short presentation, which is the first two verses of this section, and then a more extensive presentation. So verse 31 and 32 let's read go through those the army for the sake of accomplishing the welfare of sentient beings are interest steadfastness joy and relinquishment so these are the four again we often call them powers this term army is thrown in here again we see it in gelsip j's commentary like these are another set of the four armies by the way i think the armies are uh, as somebody mentioned last week, it was Richard, the elephants, you know, so you'd have, you know, that being the people who are on the elephants and kind of charging, you have the cavalry, which are on horses, you have the infantry, which are on foot, and you have the navy. I think that's what they are. But anyway, that's my guess. But I guess this is another use of that analogy of the four armies saying that this is another way to look at four forces or powers that we need to have for enthusiasm. I remember the previous ones were in verse 16, and they were like uh, the armor and uh, enthusiastic uh, armor, the armor of enthusiasm, the applied enthusiasm, uh, mindfulness and introspection, and then the control over our body and mind that leads to this form of serviceability that we discussed. So anyway, these four are the presentation here of the four armies we need. And for example, interest, the very first one, which is sometimes called aspiration or yearning or inclination. Uh, in Gyaltsev J's commentary, Venerable Fedor translated it as belief, but it is the starting point for developing our enthusiasm. And here, the example that's put forward of that one is said, it's developed through fear of suffering and contemplating its benefits, contemplating the benefits of enthusiasm. Uh, being motivated somewhat by the fear of suffering that we might have to endure if we don't put enthusiasm into the path. Thus, I shall abandon its discordant classes, the three types of laziness, and make effort in order to increase joyous effort through the powers of these four again, interest, pride, joy, and relinquishment. And then he adds on diligence and mastery, which are kind of those last two of the previous four armies that we saw. The diligence that is rooted in our mindfulness and introspection, keeping a, aware of what it is that we are doing, which is very similar to what we saw in chapter five, right? Where we looked at that kind of um, guarding alertness that we need to have. And then mastery is when you gain mastery over your mind and body and behavior through your um, control of the mind and the serviceability of the mind and body. So let's go through these as they are set out by Abbot Dr. Gelson, and you'd have this in your handout. Again, there was a set of um, uh, quotes and things that are part of a handout for this course uh, that is out on the website um, at Shantideva uh, Center. I shall develop the masses of army to destroy the discordant class of joyous effort for the sake of accomplishing the welfare of sentient beings as follows. Just as a king gains victory over his antagonist by means of the four masses of army, the four concordant conditions of joyous effort are these four. First, the power of interest, or again, belief, um, uh, aspiration. 
This has to do with generating aspiration for adopting virtuous action and discarding non-virtuous action, having contemplated actions and their results. As I mentioned earlier tonight, this is the main impetus for us to become interested in generating more enthusiasm is because we see that the law of cause and effect dictates what we are going to experience based on our behavior. If we engage in more wholehearted practice, we will gain positive results. If we get lazy and fall prey to those, you know, discord states, then we will, you know, accumulate more negativity and end up suffering. The second one that we'll get to next week, I'm sure, the power of steadfastness means to not embark on anything without examining it and having examined it, culminating what has been embarked upon, you know, kind of sticking with it. This is that sort of stay, stay to it kind of power. We're just going to keep engaging in the practice, achieving the results bit by bit, but keeping it continuous and steadfast. The third is the power of joy itself. Not discontinuing like a child engaging in play and undertaking joyous effort without satiation. So if you've ever seen children playing, uh, my brother used to be like this, he used to play all by himself with like such incredible joy. I mean, it was beyond me to do that <laughs> sometimes, but, but you know, a child in play, they just keep playing. They don't really have anything stopping that joy of, you know, again, we're, we're engaging in, something that's different than play perhaps, but we want that type of attitude that we just keep bringing more and more joy into what we're doing. Then the fourth, the power of relinquishment. This is often called, yeah, the power of rest or I think uh, Lama Zopa in his new book on the six perfections, he calls it uh, correct application, meaning that we have to have this moderation of practicing really hard when we need to and then resting when we need to develop greater strength. So resting if the body and mind become exhausted through undertaking joyous effort and immediately making joyous effort again upon having rested. Of course, that's the key to it. You don't want to fall into this sort of state where you're simply just chilling out and not doing anything and think, oh, I just need to keep resting. I, you, know, you, you rest so that you can actually engage in more wholehearted effort at another time. So let's look at what um, Gyaltsev J says about these. I won't spend much time talking about it since we already went through Abbot Dakpa Gyaltsev's, but he says here, regarding the generation of the armies that destroy the opposing factors of enthusiasm, again, the laziness is that we just went through, so as to achieve the purpose of sentient beings, similar to the king's four armies destroying his opponents, the four powers are the conducive conditions for enthusiasm. They are Belief that is aspiration regarding the practice of adapt, adopting and abandoning. Again, I like adopting better than adapting. Adapting sounds strange to me. Um, generated through contemplating karmic cause and effect. B, um, stability that does not start uh, something without investigating and which finishes what was started. So we have that kind of continual dedication to what it is that we're doing. At the top of page 16, joy that engages in effort without satisfaction, but with uninterrupted joy, just like a child engaged in play. Then the fourth one, relinquishment, that takes a break when body and mind are tired through the practice of enthusiastic effort, only to start straight away again once refreshed. So those are what we're going to be looking at for tonight and into next week and possibly even into um, the following week uh, when we conclude this course. But it says they're continuing on 16, explaining them by taking the power of belief or interest as an example. They are generated by contemplating the fears of the suffering of psychic existence and the benefits of the respective power. That is here, you know, belief, this first of the four powers. Giving up the opposing factors of not engaging in virtuous dharmas through seeing that one is able to, or the discouragement of thinking, I am not able to do this, one generates the conducive conditions of the four powers of belief, the pride of stability, uh, joy, and relinquishment. Then, during the actual practice, one diligently practices enthusiasm with these two other factors that were mentioned. First, mindfulness and introspection, which were referred to as diligence in our verse and through the power of subsequently gaining control over body and mind, which is that mastery. One then increases enthusiasm further and further, strive in such a way. 
So this is again kind of uniting these four powers with these two other factors that we already discussed again in chapter five, where we looked at the idea that we have to, you know, have this uh, paying attention to what's going on in our minds through our own mindfulness, awareness of what we're doing, our introspection that confirms that what we're doing is moving us in the right direction, and then the eventual mastery over our minds that we can have if we practice in that way. And that can result, as I pointed out last week, all the way to the degree where when we attain calm abiding, which is going to be, that'll be the subject of the next chapter, we actually will have the greatest control over our minds, perfect mastery over our minds, because then we will have meditative skill and ability to focus single pointedly on what it is we need to do and to uh, remove all the obstacles uh, that are in the mind. So let's see, let me continue on just a little bit longer. Again, I'm just trying to fit as many verses as I can into tonight, recognizing we do have a bit to go through. We're now going to get into the extensive presentation, which has parts for each of these four. You know, we're going to look at uh, them individually. Uh, the very first one, the power of belief. Uh, this has in turn uh, four parts to it. Uh, the object of belief or aspiration, the result, the cause for that, and then the concluding summary. So let's look at the object of belief. It has three outlines itself. The very first one has to do with abandoning faults, kind of doing that work that helps us to remove the faults that are in our minds. The second one we're going to look at is taking qualities, actually developing the qualities that are the complement to that. And then the third one is analyzing what one has done and what one has not done. So verse 33 says, I shall destroy the boundless misdeeds of others and myself. At that time, each of these misdeeds will be exhausted in an ocean of eons. But if within myself I do not perceive even a fraction of the endeavor for exhausting these misdeeds, then I have become an abode for boundless suffering. Why does my heart not burst at my situation, at what I am dealing with? So this is this idea that, again, what he's going to do in both this section and the next one, when he looks at the qualities, here with the faults, he first says, this is the determination we want to have. This is the thought we want to maintain that is part of this power of belief, is that we have this aspiration, this determination, this uh, inclination towards doing this work of removing and destroying all the misdeeds of myself and others, all the faults. And, you know, and at the time when I'm able to accomplish that, they'll be exhausted in an ocean of eons. Even if it takes me an ocean of eons to accomplish that, I will be dedicated to doing that because I have firm conviction that it can be done. But then he goes on in the next verse, we're going to see this again in the next part, um, that he says, but if right now within myself, I do not perceive even a fraction of what's needed, the, ex the effort that we need to exhaust all those mis misdeeds, then I'll simply become an abode for boundless suffering. I'll just have to keep experiencing the sufferings of samsara because I'll just keep having these faults. So this is the gist of this one. And the next section is that it's, and remember that Shantideva in the very beginning of this text talked about how he was writing all these verses more or less for himself. And you know, this is him continually kind of trying to get himself to practice even greater. Of course, his practice is so far beyond, you know, where most of us are, maybe all of us are. So I think it's, you know, worth taking these seriously then uh, this way of approaching it is to recognize that while we might have these fleeting moments of the power of belief, the power of aspiration, we have to keep addressing this other side of that mind that thinks, you know, well, but I'm not even really doing that. So I need to be aware that if I don't do that, I'm, there are going to be consequences. So at the top of page 17, Geltsup J says, one should destroy the boundless faults of self and others because one has made that promise at the time of generating the mind of enlightenment. When one destroys these faults, one meditates on the antidote for an ocean of eons, even for each individual fault. So that's the level of commitment we have to have is that even if it takes an ocean of eons to just remove one fault, we will do that because we are so dedicated to this path of removing all of that so we can then be free of that in helping others. Since it will come like this, if one does not observe the beginning of having started to abandon faults even partially on oneself, then one will have to experience the sufferings of the lower realms, since one cannot bear to meditate on the antidote even that much. Since one will become an abode for boundless suffering, why does one's heart not explode? Why doesn't it break our hearts that we're doing this to ourselves? You know, that instead of uh, with this power, belief and aspiration, conviction, you know, that this is what we want to do, we're not putting the effort into that. Instead, we're just 
you know, causing more suffering for ourselves, the boundless sufferings of samsara. One's heart is completely made of stone, I say. You know, it must mean that we don't really even care about our own suffering. And, and there are times, again, in this text where he does kind of go back down to a bit more of a Hinayana's kind of perspective that we should see that we are the ones in the end that also are invested in all of this. Yes, the goal is to become enlightened for the sake of others, but it's to become enlightened, to actually achieve something great for oneself, to attain complete freedom from all faults and to develop all one's own qualities. So let's go on and, and just squeeze in these last, these next two, because I think they're very much in the same line and very easy to talk about. Verse 35, in this outline about taking qualities, I shall accomplish many excellent qualities for others and myself, and I will acquaint myself with each of these qualities through an ocean of eons. Just like we saw with the faults, even if it takes an ocean of eons, we will familiarize ourselves with every one of these qualities and develop them within ourselves, however long it takes. But I have never developed acquaintance with even a fraction of these excellences. How strange it is to make without purpose this birth I have somehow found. So once more, this is pointing to the idea that we've attained this perfect human rebirth. And if we end up squandering it, wasting it by not even developing a fraction of these qualities, not even having some desire to move into the direction of these qualities. Well, again, it's just pointing out that when we're talking about this power of aspiration or belief, it has to deepen to a place where we are determined that this is what we're going to do. We are dedicated to doing whatever we can to remove faults, to achieve qualities for however long it takes, even for an ocean of eons. So here, the commentary is pretty, pretty quick. It says, one should establish the many qualities of one's own and others liberation and enlightenment because one has promised to do so. Again, this is part of the, the deal. You want to become a bodhisattva? You want to generate bodhicitta? Well, then there's things you need to do to live up to that ideal of benefiting others. You need to abandon the faults. You need to develop the qualities, however long it takes, however much effort it takes. Not to mention all the qualities, he says, if it is necessary to meditate for an ocean of eons, even for one individual quality of the marks and signs that are the resultant state of Buddhahood, the uh, 80 minor marks and the 32 signs, then one has not started to even partially meditate on those qualities. It is strange that I make meaningless this birth with its freedoms and endowments. Again, that's what signifies a perfect human rebirth. For this and future rebirths, now when somehow I have found it after such a long time. This is an expression of despair. I mean, we should be despairing that we aren't even doing this. You know, we have this perfect opportunity right now and we, we need to take it seriously. Um, it's convincing us to do that now, but the, the effects of doing it now are manifold because if we start committing with this level of aspiration, this power of belief now, it will continue to compound and develop so that it feeds into future lives and all of what it takes to achieve enlightenment, however long it takes. Even if we were, I mean, certainly if we were to practice the tantric path and attain enlightenment in this lifetime, you need unbelievable enthusiasm for that. You need to be uh, dedicated with a sincere aspiration to become enlightened as quickly as possible for the sake of others. So again, this is the beginning of this discussion of the power of belief or aspiration. Um, we'll continue on and kind of look at the few verses that close off this section on the cause, I'm sorry, the object of belief, and then we'll go on to the result of having that belief or that power, and then the causes of that, where does that come from? And so we'll kind of round out our discussion of that when we reconvene next week. Got a couple minutes left. Are there any questions or comments? Um, that uh, let me remove the spotlight here and put everyone on screen <laughs> for me so I can see if people are raising their hand. Anyone have a question or comment? Yes, Teresa. Thank you, Don. Um, mm -hmm. My question is around, uh, I don't remember what number versus what it was, but when you're, we we're talking about the bodhisattvas and that, um, you know, because they have this realization of emptiness that it, they don't mind really staying in samsara it's sort of like yeah like the suffering is um <sighs> just like you get used like not get used to it but it just uh it's it's like a less uh less of a suffering because it's empty they realized it and i i get as i was thinking about that i was just thinking about like in the Lam Rim, how we have to really develop this firm wish to get out of samsara 
because of where we're at and then how as we develop into bodhisattvas that switches mm -hmm. that's all <laughs> okay yeah. yeah and and again when, when, thanks for bringing that up teresa because again when we generate that level of renunciation and a wish to you know be free of our own suffering it is actually as a means not just you know because we do still want that for ourselves and that's not denying the fact that we will you know be willing to endure all of that it's just acknowledging that this is the main way to help us to connect to the suffering of others if we've genuinely thought of that for ourselves and wish that for ourselves then we can genuinely wish that for others you know we can kind of extend that uh, understanding and um and it is comforting, I suppose, to get these verses that are this explanation that shows us that actually, yeah, the suffering that we're signing up for does change and is not so impactful on us because of the changes that happen in our own minds. But, you know, I, I often use these worldly examples like people who dedicate themselves to um, you know, achieving something great within their lives that requires a lot of effort, requires a lot of stamina. And because they're so convinced of what it is they want to achieve, it doesn't bother them in the least. Whereas me, who was not invested in the result, I would have a really hard time dealing with it. I mean, even look at people who become doctors, uh, uh, men and women who dedicate themselves to doing all this kind of study and practice and everything so that they can be on the front line and do all kinds of things that are really hard for any of us to imagine doing who haven't done that work. Uh, they really put themselves out there, but that's because they develop that aspiration to benefit others through being able to offer them medicine, surgery, whatever is needed. So, so it becomes very slight, very insignificant for people, even in worldly terms, sometimes in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up because again, it feeds into it. But again, bodhisattvas don't stop with that, as you know, you know, they don't say, okay, I want to get out of here and get out of my suffering. They use that as a way to deeper, more deeply understand the suffering of others and their wish to also be free of their suffering. And therefore, one can dedicate oneself fully to everyone becoming free of suffering yeah good thanks Teresa. yeah anyone else any comments or questions great okay so let's go ahead and do our dedication prayers again there will be a um, a little bit of homework uh, just to review some of the points from tonight as well as a meditation uh, on its way to you tomorrow at some point or to the, the website and then you can go in and retrieve that as well as the video from tonight if there was anything that you wanted to review. Let me pull up the prayers uh, and I'll have to page down here a bit to get to the dedication prayers. Okay. So thinking about what we've done over this past two hours, all the seeds that we've planted in our own minds, especially around this topic of uh, joyful enthusiasm for our practice and how we want these seeds to eventually bring about the greatest possible results of our own enlightenment and the enlightenment of all beings. We need to dedicate to seal all of this so that everything we have thought, heard, said, all becomes a cause for the enlightenment of ourselves and all beings. So let's recite this verse with those thoughts in mind. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. Then the next verse, uh, as we know this verse very, very well from all of our uh, dedications and so on, it pertains to bodhicitta uh, that is the heart of everything we are studying in this text and how we want that mind to continue to develop and grow within our own hearts as well as the hearts of all beings, especially those who are in powers of position or positions of power, making decisions about others' welfare and so on. May all beings awaken to this mind of enlightenment. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. Then we turn our attention to our teachers beginning with His Holiness and we'll recite a prayer for Rinpoche as well as we recite these for the good health and long lives of these two teachers, extend that out to the good health and long lives of all spiritual guides wherever they exist and whatever tradition they are in. If they are helping beings to find peace, happiness through morality, compassion and so on, may they have good health, may they live very long and may we and others always have perfect guides in our lives. 
the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Then let's just, as we usually do, dedicate for anyone that we're holding in our heart right now, beings who are experiencing obstacles or suffering of a variety of you know, forms, illness, death, dying, what have you. Any being who's experiencing that that we're thinking of right now, send that positive energy out to them and think that it becomes the cause to remove their suffering immediately and to also bring them all the causes and conditions that will lead them to perfect peace and happiness. And may all beings know true peace and happiness through what we've done here tonight and all our efforts. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Enjoyed tonight's class a lot. And uh, we'll reconvene next Monday, same time, same Thanks, Zoom channel. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Don. Okay. Thank you, thank Don. You. Thank right. Bye. Bye. Stop the recording here.